I want to welcome all the attendees. Um, please silence your cell phones. Today's topic is who or what is impacting the environment. Today's speakers, we have Mary Hardy, the director of Friends of Mayaka River. We have Cassidy Statler Hyatt, technical project manager from South Face, South Face Sarasota. Rick Kirby, a senior scientist from the Climate Adaption Center, and Michael Mogul, a certified consulting broadcast meteorologist, also from How the Weather Works. And I'm going to read a brief bio from each of them. Then they will each have uh, seven minutes to give a presentation. After that, if you are a Tiger Bay member, we invite you to ask a question. Please direct your questions to a specific um, one of our guest speakers. All right, we're going to start with Mary. Mary's expertise is on environmental education and conservation. She's an entrepreneur with a unique mix of academic, artistic, and business experience. She's the very first executive director of the Friends of Mayaka River, a nonprofit organization that supports Mayaka River State Park and the wild and scenic Mayaka River. A Sarasota resident, since 2014, she holds a doctorate in social psychology from Washington University in St. Louis. She's the happiest exploring wild Florida, often on her bike and capturing its beauty with her camera. And she recently rediscovered the joys of climbing trees. So obviously we don't want to cut those down, right? <laughs> All right, our next speaker is Cassidy. She is a accredited NGBS Green Verifier. Cassidy is originally from the Northeast and moved to Florida in 2016 to finish her degree at USF in environmental science and policy with a concentration on sustainability. After working many years in restaurants and beginning her career in the natural environment, she decided her impact could be larger working in the built environment and began her work in sustainability in Manatee County and then on to sustainable building consultant. With experience in green building certifications and building sciences and energy efficiency, she is now the technical project manager at South Face Sarasota, where she manages a, the Good Use Sarasota program. In her free time, you can catch her curling up with a good book on the couch with her animals and her husband at the beach or at the gym. Our next speaker is Rick. He's the senior scientist at the Client Adaption Center. Rick is a veteran meteorologist who has spent the last two decades informing and educating the public about weather and climate issues on local and network television. His television work has been recognized as the best in the market in, on multiple occasions and voted by local television viewers. His scientific work has been seen nationally on Good Morning America, ABC's World News Tonight, and in major television markets, including Tampa, Florida, and St. Louis, Missouri. His work has also been trusted and used in the stadium during games by the St. Louis Cardinals, Major League Baseball team. Rick has also provided important game forecasts for the NFL Super Bowl and the PGA's Master Tournament. Climate concerns have been at the forefront of Rick's career over the last decade, and he has studied the trends and changing environment. Rick was part of a team that helped launch Our Changing Climate at CBS 10 Tampa Bay, an initiative to keep viewers in Florida and across the world stay educated and informed, while also letting them know what they can do to help. Rick is also an FAA licensed drone pilot and enjoys using the unique vantage points to capture the beautiful sights of Florida while recording unique and important views of climate challenged landscapes. Using drones and other technologies, he is able to create a very dynamic stories regarding climate concerns. As a master storyteller, Rick creates powerful content for electronic media that makes a real impact on world climate change. And finally, we have Michael Mogul, a certified consulting and broadcast meteorologist, How the Weather Works. He is an AMS certified consulting meteorologist, AMS certified broadcast meteorologist, and NWA digital seal. He's a seasoned meteorologist with nearly five decades of experience, three of which are with the NOAA. This included severe thunderstorm and winter weather forecasting, warning, and preparedness. He has worked as a forensic meteorologist since the mid-1990s, handling a, wi a wide array of civil and criminal cases. 
Mike has honed his skills in local and regional meteorological data analysis, locating and using numerous weather data sets, both government and non-governmental, and crafting easy to understand, scientifically accurate expert reports. Mike has, been a, is, has the computer skills to create effective courtroom graphics, the speaking skills to testify clearly and understandably in courtroom and, and deposition settings, and the ability to determine a meteorologically appropriate date of loss when such date is unclear. He has even offered weather demonst demonstrations in the courtroom to help judges, juries, and attorneys understand key weather concepts. And he's brought props, so I'm pretty excited to hear about what he's got going on. Um, as a published author, Mike has written more than a half dozen weather trade books, published some 1,500 weather articles, mostly in the WeatherWise magazine, created several educationally focused cloud charts, and collaborated with the US Postal Service on the issuance of cloud stamps in 2004. Most recently, he was interviewed about forensic meteorology on close-up radio. Can't wait to hear from these speakers. Let's each give them a hand for being here. Okay, to our speakers, you have seven minutes each to come up, give your presentation. We do have a PowerPoint for each of you ready. And then afterwards, we invite all of our Tiger Bay members to come up and ask questions. Just make sure you direct them at a specific speaker. All right, Mary, you wanna join us? Thank you everyone for being here today. Um, my name's Miri and I come to you from Friends of Mayaka River. As Christy mentioned, we are a nonprofit organization that supports Mayaka River State Park. So issues of impact on the natural world are obviously near and dear to our heart. Um, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. I love this quote from John Muir. And as Muir suggests, every action that we take is an interaction with the environment and the natural world. Each and every one of us today, getting here today, we interacted with our natural world. Living where we live, we are interacting every single day with our natural world. Um, and over the years, the lands that are now Mayaka River State Park have had a lot of interaction with humans. Um, and I'd like to share with you some stories today from the park about that impact and um, also touch on the important work the conservation work, the restoration work that is happening in the park to reverse some of those impacts. Early 1930s, there were no deer and no wild turkey left in the lands that are now Mayaka River State Park. How many folks here have been to Mayaka River State Park? One of the joys for, for many going to Mayaka River State Park, obviously, is viewing wildlife in their natural habitat. 1930s, no deer, no wild turkey left because they had been overhunted. Um, interestingly, the, the lands are now protected and became one of Florida's first and largest at over 37,000 acres state parks, thanks to a developer and the uh, first mayor of Sarasota, who thanks to his efforts, Sarasota um, also no, was no longer part of Manatee County. Um, and he saw the value in protecting our natural resources. When the park opened in 1941 to the public, there still were no wild turkey and no deer in the park. And one of the park's first managers, Alan Crawley, actually built a six acre pen. And he import imported wild turkey and deer from the Everglades, bred them in the park and released them. And that's why we now have wild turkey and deer back in the area again. Next. 
how we view our natural world, um, our values, our perspectives, our you know views on aesthetics and beauty have a strong impact on how we relate to the natural world. When the first um, government surveyor showed up to survey the dry prairie, which we now know is the second most biodiverse ecosystem in North America, didn't see any trees, just saw a whole bunch of scrubby stuff. And actually, in his report, he wrote back, I, I'm, I apologize for wasting a couple of days surveying these useless lands. So if that's your aesthetic, you know, the, the thing that they valued at the time were trees, water. One of the very first things that happened when the park was developed was they planted a lot of trees, they drained a lot of useless swamps, and they also stopped a natural force that is critical for our Florida environments, which is fire. Fire as a result of lightning. They actually had a parade down in Sarasota celebrating the end of fire. Uh, and the Florida Dry Prairie, 15,000 acres of which are now protected as part of Mayaka River State Park. Um, and the, the Florida Dry Prairie is a globally imperiled ecosystem, as I mentioned, second most biodiverse ecosystem in North America. Without fire, within two years, the ecosystem is degraded and beautiful native species like our pine lilies that are actually now um, blooming in the dry prairie, I recommend you go and visit them, cannot survive, go for tortoises. Crested caracara. In the 80s, the park reintroduced prescribed fire as a way to support 78% of Mayaka River State Park, including the dry prairie. And Within years, the crested caracara, other fire-dependent species, return to the park. We're going to need a bigger slide for this one. Invasive species. Um, invasive species are species that do not belong here, that were introduced by humans. Some of them were introduced by accident. If you look at that Cuban tree frog, um, the story is they probably just hitchhiked onto some container heading from the Caribbean to the US, ended up in a port somewhere, and the rest is history. Um, water hyacinth was brought in for one of the world fairs. People thought it would look lovely in ponds. It quickly filled their ponds. They released them into rivers. And again, the rest is history. Um, plant on the left. Can anyone recognize that one? Do you have it in your gardens? Air potato. Air potato. Now, the problem with all invasive species is because they are not part of our ecosystem, they crowd out native species. They do not provide the necessary nutrients. They're not part of our local food chain. They create a lot of issues. The park is continuously fighting from um, the heritage of the park. The park was a cattle ranch for many, many years. And um, the ranchers brought in grasses that they figured would be great for the cows. The cows didn't like the grasses, but the grass took over. The wild and scenic Mayaka River runs through the park for 12 miles. It begins in the headwaters, which are actually in Manatee County, which means the park is obviously um, very concerned about what happens in wetlands north of the park. Um, throughout the years, again, um, this very important natural force was seen as something to be controlled through dams, through ditches. In 2022, some of you might 
be aware, the dam that was on the upper Mayaka Lake was removed in order to restore the natural flow of the river. This was critical not only for the health of the ecosystems at Mayaka, but also for the health of our communities north and south of the park. And once you remove something, you need to restore. So planting native vegetation in the floodplain marshes were done to, again, protect the river and our communities. And the interesting thing was, once those habitats were restored, native wildlife returned, including wildlife that we're not used to seeing in the park, like our state imperiled black skimmers. Interestingly, they showed up, we had a flock of close to 100 birds during a period where, where you would expect to see them, by our bay, on our beaches, we were experiencing incredibly severe red tide. So they found refuge in a newly restored area by the Mayaka River. And I'll leave you with this last image of a bird named 5B, which is really not a very good name for a bird. So I call her Cece in honor of uh, Bertha Palmer. And this bird was banded on St. Beat Peach. Um, she has been nesting on Lido Beach for the past couple of years. She was part of that large flock at Mayaka. We can identify her thanks to banding, which is done to help us inform conservation efforts by being able to identify unique birds and track their behavior and their survival. Uh, I can tell you that 5B nested this year on South Lido Beach, where the birds moved because they were having a hard time on North Lido Beach. She fledged a chick, and I can also tell you that she survived Hurricane Adalia, which flooded South Lido Beach. Good morning, everybody. I'm a certified consulting meteorologist. I've worked for NOAA. Um, I've written books. You heard that in the introduction. Um, but I've also worked with groups like the Audubon Naturalist Society in Maryland in their Green Labs program. It was an environmentally based program. But they brought me in because they recognized that weather affects all of the environment, all the nature centers, all the parks, and so forth. And it's bugged me for years why all of the parks and nature centers, this is a suggestion, <laughs> don't have weather stations to assess what the weather is compared to maybe a nearby location and how it changes over time. And so I'm going to make a proposal when I go back to the Collier County Board of Commissioners that every uh, park and nature center in Collier County puts in a weather station and sets up a network. And I challenge other groups like are here to do the same thing so we can get a real handle on climate change. I'm a meteorologist. I don't make climate forecasts and so forth. But I, too, am impacted by all of the um, noise, and I'm going to call it that from a scientific perspective, of climate change. I read the news feeds on the internet every morning, and I get 20 to 30 percent of the stories have the word climate change as the cause. I've reviewed textbooks for Collier County schools that deal with science and discovered that meteorology is being lost in the textbooks but is replaced by climate change as an existential threat. I don't think that's a good thing for students to be told the conclusion rather than get to the conclusion or some, a different conclusion by critical thinking. So my goal today is to just hope that I can instill a little bit more critical thinking in you. In the last hundred years, we've heard that climate uh, carbon dioxide has grown exponentially. And yet the loss of trees has grown exponentially. So if you put those two together, which is the problem, producing too much carbon dioxide or eliminating the trees that remove the carbon dioxide? So one of the things I do when somebody passes is I plant a tree. I've been doing it in Israel. I'm Jewish. I planted the Jewish National Fund. I plant trees in Israel. But recently I had a friend who might not have appreciated a tree being planted in Israel. And I discovered that you can plant trees in Florida state parks. You can plant them in Pennsylvania state parks. And so if you're interested in planting trees to fight climate change, there's a good way to do it, even though the trees may only be this big as opposed to the trees that were lost in the last 100 years. So this is the Mauna Loa Hawaii Observatory showing the growth of carbon dioxide. 
This is the point I want to make this morning. Um, it's data provided from NOAA and other organizations that monitor it. It's away from most sources of carbon dioxide, so the carbon dioxide's well mixed globally by the time they sample it. And you notice the stair-step approach. Every year, the graph keeps going up. So the top graph is one cycle of the carbon dioxide values. I don't know if you can see it there. I'll tell you what it is. There are seven monthly periods where the carbon dioxide levels grow, four monthly periods where the carbon dioxide levels go down, and one where it's basically unchanged. Wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to have six months and six months based on the seasons? That's what I thought until I started looking into this graph. And I started thinking about how trees green in the northern hemisphere. I've eliminated southern hemisphere here because there's not enough trees down there. They don't have enough land mass. There's a tree at the end of its growing season. Next. And there's two leaves, one that are fully green and one that are starting to die at the end of the season. So over the course of a six month period from spring to fall, the trees start to green from south to north. Just when the whole northern hemisphere is green, we go back the other way. We only get four to five months of real carbon dioxide removal just due to the normal seasonal march of the greening of deciduous trees. How many of you have heard that addressed in any climate change article, news report, or anything? The International Panel on Cli Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has not even looked at this. But they've concluded that carbon dioxide is the problem, and we're the culprit. This is really important, and there's more. I, I have like 50 different other things that contribute to global warming, and one of them, real quickly, relates to this infrared temperature gun. I have gone outside on a hot day, and by the end of my driveway, I have a patch of grass, pavers, a concrete drainage slab, and asphalt. The grass is 96. The pavers, the concrete, and the asphalt are 140. Multiply that by every household, every highway, every road, every roof. And, there, and I haven't even talked about cars, which are natural greenhouses. Um, and you have all these sources of heat in the atmosphere that have nothing to do with burning of fossil fuels. So I'm not a proponent that we should keep burning fossil fuels, but I am a proponent of this. And if we don't think this, we're going to make some very serious financial and other decisions that are not going to produce tangible results. And the people that make those decisions won't be here to be held accountable. So I'm accountable right now. I'm telling you, we need to think more before we act more. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Mike, you're on board with uh, warming temperatures, just not necessarily the cause. Uh, the data says temperatures are going up. Yes, okay. So, And we've sensed that, right? Uh, so, especially this past summer, again, uh, first of all, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I know she read my bio earlier, but uh, there's my background. Primarily, my background has been in broadcast television. Uh, I don't want to tell you how long because it's... Uh, it's a long time now. It goes fast, doesn't it? Um, but I, I've done a lot of great things uh, that have been so much fun to be part of uh, locally at CBS in Tampa, uh, Tampa Bay Times, lots of radio stations around here as well. I've done some network appearances for Good Morning America, ABC World News, and been part of all kinds of great sports programs uh, and events as well. This is why like, trying to make sense of climate is important to me. I know it's a, a hot button issue. It's, it's political. It's hard to know who you can trust, what you can believe. Um, so I get that. And I decided to go from broadcast television to climate to try to make sense of it for uh, my friends and family and for uh, millions of people that follow me on social media every month. And for these guys, I have two grown kids and two little ones as well. So this is Duke and Kylie. They're my little ones at home with me. And uh, they're five and seven. And uh, so, you know, they 
The world is just a magical place to them. So, you know, I want to try to help educate people and, and try to figure it out along with all of you guys to make the world uh, a, continue to be a beautiful place for them, especially here in Florida. And that's one thing at the Climate Adaptation Center, where I'm now working, uh, based in Sarasota, where we focus um, not only on world climate, but right here uh, in Tampa Bay, Sarasota, Manatee County, um, you know, what's going on and what's likely to happen next and things we can do to prepare for this, not just us personally. Uh, but also decision makers, political people, um, you know, how we build things, where we build things, how we do roads, things that may flood. Uh, you know, we have we know we have rising sea levels out there. We've seen it already. More is to come. And uh, so we want to prepare for that and, and make sure we're we're being wise. Like Mike talked about, we want to be smart. We want to think about this. So the CAC is an independent, non-political, unbiased, non-profit organization uh, trying to use facts and science from from sources that we can trust. Um, our CEO is, is a gentleman named Bob Bunting. He's a former lead forecaster for the National Weather Service. Uh, he was also a director at the university, uh, UCAR, they call it University uh, Corporation for Atmospheric Research, uh, which is part of UCAR, which is one of the biggest climate organizations in the world. He's currently, he would be doing this speech today, actually threw me at you. Uh, but he would be here today, but he's given a speech in Switzerland as we speak. Uh, the Climate Adaptation Center, again, is a focal point for understanding our specific climate here in Florida and how we can make this uh, um, a, a, a safe place as we go forward and try to protect everything we know and love about this. Um, the CAC does have specific 2030, 2040, and 2050 forecasts. You can go to the website at theclimateadaptationcenter.org and see more about that. Um, this does include uh, for as much of 11 inches of sea level rise as we head to 2050. So a lot of that could come uh, in 2030 um, with some uh, what we call moon wobble. The moon orbit uh, can cause a little more high tides and stuff like that. And this is a thing as we have higher sea level rises. One thing that happens when you get higher tides, we're already seeing this, is we get sunny day floods and things without even storms. These high tides come in and they can uh, cause real issues in flood prone areas. So uh, that's just one thing. There's a look at the website again and that website address. So what is climate change? I just kinda wanna break this down to you because I know we hear about it all the time. I don't know if we all have a, a, a full understanding, but basically climate refers to long-term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns. You're, you're basically, weather's kinda day to day, but climate is the long-term changes that we see. The greenhouse effect, greenhouse gases, they're important. We couldn't survive on this planet without greenhouse gases. So it's not like they're a bad thing. They're a good thing. Too much can be a bad thing. Uh, the, the sun comes in, solar radiation comes in, it goes through our atmosphere, the earth absorbs it, it warms, we need that warmth to survive, and then it re-radiates heat. Much of that excess heat escapes to space. If you get too much greenhouse gas, though, uh, it's like a greenhouse. It traps it and we continue to warm, warmer than we uh, would necessarily need. We uh, Big greenhouse gas that's often not talked about is water vapor. It's natural. We're not really adding that, so we won't talk about that too much. But Mike touched on carbon dioxide. Um, that, that is in our atmosphere. It's a natural greenhouse gas. Too much of that can cause problems. Uh, you can talk about where it comes from. Um, and, you know, Mike mentioned trees, for example. Uh, trees are a good carbon sink where they actually absorb a lot of that carbon dioxide. So that's a good thing. And deforestation, as he mentioned, is a problem. Um, and it's a big problem. So, uh, you know, the forestation management is, is, is a huge asset that, that we, we need to work on. But methane is another big one, nitrous oxide and fluorinated gases, F gases is another part of that. And you can see mainly where all greenhouse gases come from, electricity production, transportation industry, agriculture, and of course, commercial and residential. You know, you think about residential, it's your electricity production, it's, it's uh, air conditioning, all the beautiful things we need we just have to figure out how to manage these better. But you can see some of the sources, these F gases, the fluorinated gases, uh, a lot of that can come from things like your mobile air conditioning. Um, and, and who wants to drive around without uh, air conditioning in your car? No way, right? So it's not that we don't want these things. We just have to figure out how to manage these things better. Here's a, a measurement of uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, this one is from NASA sensors in... Um, you know, this is uh, since 1960, and you can see the spike in this over time. Indirect measurements of CO2 or carbon dioxide would come from ice cores, and if you look back thousands of years, there's a level, that dashed line that we've never gone over, and since the Industrial Revolution, you see the spike. Human population has doubled in the last 50 years. 
So while deforestation uh, is a thing, no doubt, uh, you have to you have to consider the human contribution. And I'm not saying, um, you know, we're going to argue about what percentage of that, but there, you can't deny we don't have some contribution to this with that many more people using all of this tech, technology and uh, expending all of these different gases from the things we love. Global temperatures, you can see, continue to rise as well over time here. We've lived it. We've experienced it. June was the hottest June on the planet. July was the hottest July on the planet. August, the hottest August. Summer was the hottest summer on the planet. And uh, uh, NASA says the entire year may be a record year. The 10 warmest years on record have all occurred since 2010, with the last nine being the warmest. And 2024 is expected to be warmer than this year here. So this summer was hot. Next summer uh, may be hotter. Hotter temperatures mean higher sea levels. When water warms, we have thermal expansion. So it's not just sea ice melting and making more water. Water actually expands. So as that happens, we get higher sea levels. And an example of this, if you took a of water on your stove and warmed it up, it's going to expand. It's going to get higher. Um, so thermal expansion is something that the oceans are seeing. The oceans cover two-thirds of the world, right? So they absorb most of this excess heat, and that's causing real issues. You can see the, the sea level change here uh, uh, since 1993, and it's almost up everywhere in the world. Um, so global average sea level has risen eight to nine inches since uh, uh, 1880, and we've seen since 1993 in just that short time, four inches of global sea level rise, and it's that rate that we're really concerned about as it continues. Heavy rain events as well. As the atmosphere gets warmer, it can hold more water vapor, and so that's fuel for storms. So while we may see more droughts and heat waves, when it does rain, those rain events tend to be heavier than they typically are. Hurricanes, of course, are stronger as well. We're seeing more rapid intensification with these storms and more major hurricanes. Cat 3 hurricanes are above. We've seen um, this is three times more frequent than 100 years ago, uh, says the National Hurricane Center. And the climate change is likely to lead to higher storm surge because those sea levels are higher. So the water's starting at a higher point. So we get more storm surge from these storms. And then droughts. You look at the current uh, drought situation. Uh, we're going to see more frequent droughts, longer droughts, more severe droughts. And you see right there, there's a current drought situation. And we have that right here. We've seen one of the driest rainy seas. This is the rainy season uh, here in our area. So it's not been good. Human activity or something else. NASA says it's not the sun output um, that's causing this. Uh, while that can happen, solar irradiance can cause more heat. Sometimes volcanic, we, of course, eruptions can cause issues. There's a low Look at the output from the sun. You see temperatures continue to go up. So uh, we do think there is human contribution here, guys. In in you know we have to figure out um, you know what we can do to make things better. But there you see some of the expected. Uh, uh, things to happen as we go forward as we continue the track we're on right now. What should you do? Well, you can try to save energy at home, of course. That helps. Energy efficient appliances doesn't hurt at all. Change your home's energy source perhaps to renewable source if that's possible. Uh, solar, wind energy. A lot of people are going solar. It's not only cheaper, but it's good for the environment. Uh, you can consider electric or hybrid vehicles. I understand that's an issue as well, but there's some uh, definite carbon footprint help right there. And then speak up, talk to others. Learn about it, you know, find out more information about it. And then the CAC, well, we're here to support everybody and learn more about this. I'm going to get all of these slides, by the way, that'll be on the video as well. And you can reach out to me too. If you'd like to get involved with the CAC, you can take your phone right there, point your camera to that, and you can learn more about it. There's my phone number. Call me, text me. We can have a coffee. We can talk. Mike will come with me and we'll have a lot of fun, right, Mike? Sorry, guys, we had to hurry, but thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good to see you guys. Um, so my name is Cassidy Stotler Hyatt. I'm the technical project manager for South Face Sarasota. Really briefly, South Face Sarasota is a nonprofit organization. We work with the built environment in the sustainability and energy efficiency world. Um, we have been in Sarasota for two years, but we are based out of Atlanta, and we've been there for about 45 years. This might look familiar because it was on Rick's slide two. Um, it is the United Nations definition of climate change. And the key thing that I wanted to point out here is that it's long-term shifts in temperature and weather. So if you have, if we have a mild winter and you're like, oh, global warming isn't real, look at this mild winter. These are gonna be longer term shifts. Um, and primarily, United Nations says primarily due to the burning of fossil fuels, which produces heat trapping gases. 
Of those heat trapping gases, like Rick mentioned, is going to be your carbon dioxide and methane that can um, that comes from combustion processes. Um, this might look similar as well because it was something like this on Rick's presentation. <laughs> um, my point of this graph is to just point out that carbon dioxide fluctuates through the millennia. That is absolutely normal. It's going to go up and down and up and down. But what I would like to point out is that um, it has grown exponentially, whereas usually these shifts happen over millions and millions of years. So the Earth has time to kind of make up for those increases in carbon dioxide through rock uh, sequestration or through the ocean or through trees. But because these have increased so drastically, we don't have time. The Earth doesn't have time to catch up. This is from NOAA and it's a map and everyone talks about money, right? Money gets everyone's attention. So in 2023, um, up until July, the United States has spent $15 billion on weather or climate related disasters. Um, that is not including, obviously, Hurricane Idalia, which is, according to a Tampa Bay Times, estimated between $78 million and $371 million just on agricultural damages alone. So we've spent a lot of money on these um, weather-related disasters that are only just going to get worse. So what I like to focus, is on, focus on is... Now what? What can we do? Um, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are just going up. So how can we how can we change that? Um, my focus is on buildings. So 39% of United States energy usage comes from buildings, and that's going to be a combination of residential and commercial use. Our impact on buildings is huge, and it, buildings' impacts on us is also huge. So at the end of 2022, the average age of buildings in the United States was about 54 years old. So that means it was built in the late 60s. I'm not sure the last time one of you entered a home or a, a building that was built in the late 60s that hadn't been renovated or upgraded in any way, shape, or form. It's pretty rough. Um, there's no insulation. You're basically cooling or heating the outdoors. Um, so your HVAC system's working even harder than it needs to be. You're wasting energy. And most importantly, you're throwing money away. Um, so that's important because we need to renovate these buildings. We need to upgrade these buildings. We need to do them the right way because by 2040, two thirds of all of our buildings that we have now are going to be there in 2040 as well. Um, that's also gonna impact our indoor air quality too. So that's something we need to think of to be healthy inside. So what can we do? Um, some of the energy efficiency measures that we like to do at South Face and that everyone can do in either your homes or your businesses, your office buildings, whatever, is upgrading to LED lighting, um, upgrading to Energy Star appliances for saving water measures, low flow plumbing, um, heat pump water heaters, high efficiency HVAC and proper sizing. Um, so once you add that weatherization and insulation to your home, you can um, actually resize your HVAC because a lot of times we're oversizing our HVAC because we live in Florida. It's hot. We want to make sure we are cold in our homes. And so we're oversizing those things. Um, we go back one. Sorry. Really quick, some tax incentives that are coming down federally for you to be able to do these things. If you own a business or if you are part of a nonprofit, there are tax rebates and tax incentives for these projects. So you can get up to 30% um, back on your project if um, you put solar. Uh, you can get money back from reducing your overall energy usage in general. And then you can also get a bunch of money if you buy electric vehicles. So like the, for the first time ever, local government can buy electric fleets and they'll get $7,000 back um, per vehicle for the lower weight of vehicles. So just like a normal car, not an ambulance or a fire truck or things like that. And then on top of that, um, so the money, the early accepted money was vetoed, but there's another chance for the state to accept it in about a year. And these are incentives for your home. So as a consumer, you can get money back for these. So um, Efficient HVAC equipment, efficient heat pump water heater, um, solar. You can al already get tax incentives for electric vehicles now. Um, so keep, keep in the loop on what's going to happen with that. Next. Thank you. So to tie that all together, um, the energy efficiency really means savings. And so that's what I kind of wanted to mention this. So our good use program, which is what I work with, it is a matching grant program for nonprofit organizations for um, energy and water efficiency upgrades. So 
ultimately our goal is to lower their carbon emittance, lower their utility usage, lower their water usage, but at the end of the day, we're saving them money to go back into their mission. And when nonprofits are happy and they're working well, so are communities. About 30 more seconds, Okay, so um, overall grantees have saved about $3.5 million in the past 18 years from our good use program. So that's three and a half million dollars that they're putting back into their organizations. Next slide. And really quick, I'll wrap it up. Um, we've saved 26 million kilowatt hours of electricity saved, um, 16,000 gallons, kilogallons of water saved, thousands of carbon dioxide from not reaching the environment. And the, my favorite part is all of this money goes back into the nonprofit. So with food banks that we've worked with, from the money they've saved, 1.7 additional meals were served per year in the community. So the overall arching topic, you can go next slide, is that sustainability is going to be, is your savings. When you get that more efficient equipment, when you upgrade your buildings, you are literally saving dollars. And with utility race, rates increasing, you can't really argue with that. That's it. Thank you, Chief. Thank you to each of our speakers. If you would like to have a question, you're a Tiger Bay member. Please see Jonathan right over here. I will repeat your question just to make sure it's heard for the microphone. The question was about resiliency within our state with sustainability. How many minutes do I get for this? <laughs> you get 30 seconds. Uh, 30 seconds. No, no, I, I think the biggest thing is going to be water levels in flood prone areas because that's where a lot of money is spent. I can, the traffic circle downtown Sarasota, for example, uh, still floods. So there, there are issues like that. And that's one thing I, I know at the CAC, we want to try to get with the planners, these city, when they're spending these public dollars and try to make sure they're considering, um, you know, future water levels and, and what that means with tides and not necessarily just hurricanes, but just the, the daily tides that we see and the seasonal tides that are higher than others. So that's a big one to me and you do got to consider a hotter world too um, and what that's going to mean for people for kids you know youth sports things like that if temperatures are you know a couple of degrees higher humidity is higher the heat index is higher it just makes life harder and, and, and a little more risky heat related deaths are one of the biggest things uh, the, the number one killer of, of weather so um, you know that's another issue that we have to consider as well but I think spending money along water is probably the number one thing I would recommend to and, and of course we have to be hurricane proof you know with our buildings as well um, so cloud seeding is a thing, of course. Um, you know, you can cloud seed to grow clouds to try to get and put something in there for the water vapor to condense upon and make clouds. As far as chem trails, you're talking about, um, are you talking about something like um, that is done purposely to poison people or are you talking about exhaust from jets? I'm sorry? Mm, Mike? We got it. But the question is, why did somebody get to do that without us having the okay to steal precipitation from one region to another? Well, let me, let me answer the question. Airplanes routinely flying at high altitude release what well, let me address it so better understood because some people think chemtrails are the contrails that come out of regular jet aircraft they release certain chemicals just part of the burning of the the fuel and they release carbon dioxide oxygen water vapor etc okay there are people that do seed clouds specifically and what happens in that case is they usually use silver iodide because that's what is a hygroscopic process that supposedly makes the raindrops bigger the problem is that if I make it rain over Rick's house and I take rain away from your house, there was actually a lawsuit in Pennsylvania which said you can't do that. So why people do it, that's got to be some state regulation or so forth. I can't explain it, but it's not a well-proven concept that cloud seeding produces more rain. It produces maybe more cloud droplets, but they may not be big enough to fall as rain based on other conditions, okay? Since I got up here, I want to follow Rick's question a minute about resiliency stuff. There's a lot of push on resiliency. I concur wholeheartedly. I want to call your attention to Houston, Texas. How many people have been to Houston? If you drive around the highways, the interstate highways in Houston, you will now see flood markers in bright yellow that go up 15, 17 feet in the underpasses because Houston is concrete and asphalt city. And I have told the county commissioners in Collier County, that's my county, 
that if they keep building in Collier County, we will become Houston East. And that's a very important consideration at the local level, not for hurricane flooding necessarily, but rainfall flooding, because concrete and asphalt do not absorb water. It has to run off somewhere. So I just throw that out for people's consideration. The biggest thing we can do is make sure that we stop building houses 17 feet from the beach. Yeah. Or, garages. or garages, whatever. So what we did in, in North Carolina when we built a house, we, it was the third dune back from the beach, and we made sure that the lot was filled with extra sand so that we were at least a couple of extra inches to feet higher than what would have been there. I drove around Naples and I watched the houses built right at street level. I don't know why the, the plot for the house isn't a little bit higher and you have drainage areas between the houses. These are things we can do locally. We don't need a state mandate to do that necessarily, although maybe so, but they're back to this. Okay, do we have one last question? Yeah, this actually fits in extremely well with what Michael said about the D. Okay, Co Commissioner Cruz's question is the natural versus man-made engineering, and how do we see the solutions for our environment? Did you want to address Cassidy first? Well, she's shaking her head, so she seems like she knows. <laughs> okay, so we're going to give everybody one minute each. I realize we're running over. I apologize for that. We did have a little bit of some problems starting out, and again, I apologize. But you want to start with Cassidy, and then we'll have Mary. I'm an active listener, sorry. I <laughs> nod and I, and I shake my head. Um, as far as research done on engineered versus natural, I can't give you the, the exact percentage, but what I will say is natural is usually going to beat out that engineered um, wetland. Um, their doctor, uh, his name is blanking, but he works in the Everglades, and they have tried to emulate natural wetlands and what the Everglades can do versus what they have been trying to emulate it's not going to compete. And at a certain point, we're gonna run out of land. So that we're gonna run out of space to even build those engineered spaces, you know? So I think it's a double-edged sword. And I think not um, invading the natural spaces is the first step. And looking at what we already have in place, um, going to the abandoned buildings and repurposing them. There's so many commercial storefronts since COVID that are sitting empty because people are working from home. Our lives since COVID have drastically changed. And so it's repurposing all of these spaces before we're building new is my personal like first step. Thank you, Cassie. Yep. Mary? Thanks for the question. That is a that is a very good final question, and I think it is top of mind for a lot of us. From what we've seen at Mayaka River State Park, obviously, as I tried to very quickly outline, a lot of impact, and a lot has been about managing wetlands and water. And um, after Ian, as a lot of you are aware, the park was completely flooded. The park manager was able to drive the entire park drive on an airboat. It was, the water was that high. But the important thing to consider is that all of our wetlands and all of our marshlands did what they were supposed to do, which is contain the water. If that had all been developed, what happened down south in Northport would have been even worse. So I think the thing to keep in mind is we need the wetlands and we not just need them to be there, we need them to be healthy. And Cassidy, yeah, natural is best. And I think just kind of seeing the big picture of why we need these natural spaces intact and healthy and not engineered is kind of where we're going. And I'd love to chat with you more about that. Yeah. So much of what we have to consider going forward with climate change <clears throat> is the money, right? We're always dealing with the money, whether it's development, uh, there's always going to be money involved. Um, natural is best, no doubt about it. But I don't want to also um, disconsider like a manufactured wetland and that stuff too much because creating what we call carbon sinks. Have you heard the term carbon sinks? So it's a, it's actually absorbs carbon dioxide, you know, planting trees, right? That forestation, forestation management. Management, um, things like that. So keep that in mind. Um, we do need to protect what's natural out there as much as we can. We got to fight um, the, the profits of the world um, to protect our environment, no doubt about it. But 
when they do create additional carbon sinks, that is a good thing. Um, but not if it's at the cost of destroying everything that we already have. We definitely have to protect that. Mike? All right, I mentioned Houston a minute ago. I want to go to Galveston. Big hurricane, 1900, basically wiped out Galveston Island. A company in Colorado was asked to come in and build a seawall. The seawall over time has protected Galveston. No way about it. There's no beach left in Galveston. There is a seawall. The Army Corps of Engineers has 32 projects around the state of Florida, county by county, to make resiliency the watchword along the coast. I've attended two meetings in Collier County and discovered that what they're doing in Collier County does not match what they're doing in Lee County. What do you think is going to happen at that interface? So that's one thing that's pretty important is that if we're going to have building, we better make sure that the building makes sense. And I will tell you, the Army Corps of Engineers was involved in building levees on the Mississippi River. It stopped flooding of farmland, but no silt is carried down the Mississippi now or limited silt, and that is destroying the Delta. In Ocean City, Maryland, a hurricane in 1933, see, I have all this stuff. In 1933, cut an inlet in Assateague Island. The locals said, great, I don't have to go all the way down here to go out fishing, leave the inlet open. So they built groins and jetties and kept it open. Because of that sand transport along the ocean current, along the coast due to longshore currents, uh, destroyed the northern part of Assateague Island. So the problem is when you come up with a solution, whoever is proposing that solution, and no offense to the panelists, because we're all guilty of this, but we tend not to look at long-term impacts because we want that short-term solution. And then down the road, oh my goodness, I never thought about that. Let's build something else to fix what we messed up in the first place. And so we have to avoid that. So I know I'm directing this at the county people here, but please think of the long-term impacts, not just the short-term. And remember that when you build something, and by the way, the Army Corps of Engineers is designed to build things. They don't look at alternative solutions very often. They're starting to look at them down, at least in Collier. But Florida Gulf Coast University is studying whether they should use excess old concrete and stuff like that to build an artificial barrier island to protect the coastline. That's what barrier islands do. But I don't know, I'm not the chemist here, I don't know the chemistry of putting in old concrete in the ocean, what that might do. So the point is, there's lots of engineering solutions, there's lots of individual solutions, there's lots of community solutions, um, and any one of us can make an impact. But remember, we are the United States. There's a lot of the rest of the world that's not on board with this. So if we make everything perfect and the rest of the world doesn't, where do we stand in all of this? So it's a very complicated issue. I don't have solutions. I have questions. I'm a scientist. I have questions. <laughs> I hope you'll have questions, too. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, and thank you all so much for being patient with me and with Tiger Bay today. We truly appreciate you attending. Next month, our topic will be on the media and how they affect our politics. I think that'll be a really interesting debate. We hope that you will all join us. Um, and please, take a few moments to thank our speakers today.